Did you ever wonder what happened to Billy in the Predator movie? Billy's demise took place off screen, leaving us to imagine what could have happened. A lot of questions were left behind because of this scene. Today in this video, I'm going to look at a bunch of sources and see if we have any possible answers to this question. Billy was part of a special rescue team sent into the jungles of Central America. He served as the team's tracker. Major Dutch Schaefer led his team on many missions, but this one was different. They were requested by Dylan, who was working in the CIA. He was an old friend of Dutch, and he knew Dutch's team was the best at what they do. Dylan had tricked his old friend into doing this mission that nobody else could do. Dutch was told he was to rescue hostages, but the real reason was to collect information about the enemy's operation. They would capture a prisoner during their mission. Her name was Anna. At first, she tried to escape, but later, she would remain with Dutch's team. Along the way, Dutch's team was being stalked by something. Not a man, not an animal, but something not of this world. Anna remembered stories that were passed down by her people of something hunting men in the jungle, the one who makes trophies of man. This could have been the reason Anna stayed with Dutch's team. Her best chance of survival was to help them get out. Each member of Dutch's team was getting picked off, one by one. They were stalked, hunted, and eliminated. First, it was Hawkins, then Blaine. Dylan was next, and then Mac died shortly after, until only Poncho, Billy, Dutch, and Anna were left. Near the end of the film, Dutch is seen carrying Poncho, who was injured during their attempt of capturing this hunter. Billy stays behind as they cross a log. Dutch looks back, but Billy is standing his ground, ignoring Dutch's call to go with them. He drops his gear and his weapon, pulling out a large knife. He makes a long cut across his chest and it bleeds. Staring into the jungle, Billy waits for this hunter. And the hunter does arrive. It shows up in front of Billy. It sees Billy with its thermal vision. This is how it tracks its prey. Billy is heard screaming in the distance, but details about this fight and how he died were left a mystery in the film. It was a way for the fans to imagine what could have happened. The script for the movie underwent many changes over the years. Different versions were brought in, and by the time the final version was selected, things from character names, deaths, and battles were changed. In the draft from July 27th in 1985, Billy's character went by the name of Miguel. He still acted as the team's tracker and gave his best opinion on what route to take based on their circumstances. Miguel would separate from the team at some point, going ahead with a map and flare. He goes off alone to reach the recon ship and wait for the team there. After the scene where Dutch, who is named Matheny, is covered in mud for the first time, the Predator does not find him and moves on. Then, there's a scene where Miguel appears in the chopper searching with binoculars. He does not see Matheny and the chopper disappears over the top of the canyon. Miguel is then seen at the end of the script and never goes through the mysterious death that Billy went through. Then we have the script from April 7th in 1986. In this draft, Billy's name is now inserted into the story. When they get to the scene where Dutch, Poncho, and Anna cross the log, Billy stays back, but there's a few small details that are not shown in the film. Here's how that scene goes. The jungle is still, deathly silent. Schaefer, Anna, and Ramirez cross the log, moving on to the other side. Billy, still at the foot of the log, providing cover, turns to face the jungle. He lifts his head towards the trees, feeling the onrushing presence of the hunter. He shrugs off the radio, letting it fall, smashing into the rocks below. He casts away his weapon, staring forward. He reaches into his cargo pocket, withdrawing a small grease paint tin, covering his finger in black paint. He applies dark slashes under his eyes and again, vertically down his cheeks. Taking another dab of paint, he makes a symbol on his bare skin over his heart. He drops the tin, withdrawing his combat knife. Holding the knife, he grasps the medicine bag around his neck, yanking it free with a quick snap. He wraps the leather thong around his hand and knife, binding the weapon and bag together. Staring outward, as if in a trance, he begins a low chant. On the other side, 
Schaefer carrying Ramirez on his back, laboring up the steep slope, nearing the top, turns and sees Billy standing, waiting at the foot of the bridge. Schaefer screams out, Billy! But Billy stands at the foot of the bridge, knife raised, waiting, accepting his oncoming destiny. Schaefer calls out from again, Billy! In frustration, Schaefer hikes Ramirez higher onto his back, digs in and sprints to the top of the hill, Anna waiting at the top. The scene goes back to Billy. He crouches low, knife extended in a fighting position. Over the top, in a low depression, Schaefer props Ramirez against some rocks, reaching for his weapon. They hear Billy's echoing scream. Instantly, the weapons are raised, cocked and ready. The scene from the previous draft where a chopper searches the river for Dutch is still in this version. It takes place after the predator does not find Dutch covered in mud, but Billy is not in the chopper and it's only a soldier scanning the area. This draft has a small scene with Anna after this event. She runs into a clearing, stopping momentarily, gasping for breath. She is startled by a sudden movement behind her. She spins, looking. There's nothing there. She runs on. I can see why this scene was not in the film. It's too short and does not add much to the story. There's nothing else mentioned about Billy unless you read the novel. It has a bunch of different things when compared to the movie. It said that Billy was a psychic whose ancestors fought against these hunters long ago. They could use one of the scenes from the first movie, either the one where Billy senses something in the trees or when he makes his final stand against the predator in the end. During either scene, he could remember that his ancestors told him about this hunter creature from the past, and now it has returned. They could say that Billy was a descendant of the people in the Prey movie. That's how they could connect them together. The novel of Predator was based off an early draft of the script, so there's a lot of things that are very different, but it still has other sections that are similar. There were a few scenes showing the inside of the Predator ship. For example, in the novel, the body of Hawkins is brought to the ship and his spawn is ripped out in the same way as it was done to Billy's body in the movie. Billy's death was detailed a bit more in the novel. After they hear his scream, here's what it says. It was Billy Soul's final stand. The alien had taken him in a flash. Its weapon slicing through the Indian's jugular and then zigzagging down his chest and belly like a mockery of some tribal blessing. Later on he retrieves Billy's body and this happens. As it arrived at the north bank of the river, it churned up rocks and dirt with its spurs as it strode to Billy's body. It bent and began to pull the Indian apart, its narrow yellow optic nerve centers pulsing as it searched out the fading heat patterns of Billy's cooling organs. The novel also changes the predator into some type of shape-shifting creature. It's able to absorb and replicate things it can touch. Here's what it says in the novel early on. Meanwhile, about a hundred feet downwind, the observer absorbed the cells of a banana palm. It consumed the tree and at the same time replicated it perfectly. In a microsecond, there was no tree at all. It was just a thought now. In the nerve cluster of the chameleon-like invader, though even the monkeys running in the fronts were not aware of the transformation, the blackened bananas looked exactly the same and tasted the same to the flies. The creature sent out its radar, silent as followed. The bottom section explains the alien invader was collecting specimens of different life forms to study them. It watched over Blaine and Mac, not sure of what their purpose was, so it plans to study them as well. The being thought the men must be feeding, drinking up the current like pollinating bees. It could not understand yet what the purpose of these creatures was. Every other species seemed to fit in the scheme of things. And the invader had traveled throughout the universe to study that scheme. It had gathered specimens of each till they were stacked and filed in its mind like butterflies in a cabinet. Not man. Man was other, like the alien itself. It was as if the universe had finally dared to think up a proposition equal to the alien's capacity for wonder and all it knew was this, it must possess them. This version of the Predator seemed to fear the weapons of man. It occurs when Dutch's team fights the gorillas in their campsite. It says here, the banana palm on the downhill slope suddenly seemed to shrivel. 
the alien withdrew to the safety of the ground, as if it couldn't bear the intensity of what was starting to happen. Its optic cells were blinded by the white-hot flashes of the explosion. Its heat-sensitive radar temporarily overwhelmed. Power like this made it frightened of men, and it hated to be frightened. It had its own code, if nothing so real as pride or honor. It simply could not tolerate any power more explosive than its own, so it sank into itself to figure out a strategy. It had to win, even here on this weakling planet, whose creatures were bent on destroying one another. The hunter's appearance in the movie was also very different compared to the novel. Now, in the novel, it was like this. Its body was humanoid and vast, seven feet tall with ice blue scales from head to foot. It wasn't a man exactly, but more like a vision of man, tortured and perfected by a mind that longed to advance the species and make it triumph in the jungle habitat. You could say it was an homage to the warriors it tracked all day. It had to be itself and them all at once. As it reached the jungle floor, you could see it had powerful three-toed feet, along with three-fingered prehensile hands. One weapon it used was a type of throwable spear of some kind, but as the weapon was retrieved, it changed color and keyed to the alien's skin, a merging of reptilian tones, till the arm and the weapon were flesh of one flesh. That description makes it seem like the weapon can also merge into its body or the weapon itself can also camouflage. The movie gives the indication that Billy had a sixth sense, but the novel adds more to that, saying he is more of a psychic with mystical powers, like being aware of a strange density in the air around him, a sign that something in the jungle was different. He can't find any evidence to confirm his suspicions, not a sound, not a shadow, or even a rustle of leaves. The blue macaws sat row upon row in the fir trees, seeming to mock him, yet he was certain something was out there, waiting, watching, and burning with danger. On and on he stood motionless as a statue, till he seemed lost in a self-induced trance. He was tapping into another dimension now, the culmination of hundreds of years of inherited psychic sensitivity. Billy's birthright as the last of the shamans of his tribe, he had never been taught any of it as he opened his mind now to vibrations from the unknown and the unseen around him. As he zeroed in on the presence and drank its thoughts, he was fully magic for the first time. What Schaefer had seen in him before was only a shadow of his transformation here. Billy had always ducked it in the past, or he shook it off like a dog shook water. Now he could not turn from it. He had been waiting all his life to see as deep as this. Then we have the part where Billy's ancestors fought a similar creature long ago, and his magical powers expand even more, up to how Billy can now intercept the alien's thoughts. He was cast adrift in his tribe's collective memory, suffused with legends and ancient battles. He began to sway as he murmured an old Siu chant, and though he could never have told what the words meant, he saw the image clearly. The legend described a Herculean adversary who had come from the meadow beyond the sky, a god creature of wrath who murdered half of Billy's people. This was all a hundred generations ago, but the chant locked in his throat. He could feel the breath of the ancient marauder, and the recognition sent shockwaves of horror through his soul. Billy's eyes were wide and glassy now, as if he no longer needed them to see. Now he could focus directly on the alien's mind. He gathered all his strength, till his ears rang with the beating of his blood. Now his own soul broke open, like an extra-dimensional searchlight, and he scanned the jungle sky, and intercepted the alien's thoughts, slicing into them like a laser. But the intensity was torturous, and Billy wavered and tried to pull back, his mind screaming from the stress of the trance. The ringing in his head accelerated now to a louder pitch as he began to lose his grip on the alien. He knew he had encountered a force stronger than all the hundred generations. Then his soul faltered, and his eyes rolled back in his head, and he collapsed in Schaefer's arms. The Major crouched gently, lowering Billy to the ground, the Indian's chest heaving as he gasped huge quantities of air. 
It was as if he hadn't breathed at all in the last five minutes. The sweat soaked out of him. His pulse beat furiously. His face beat red, and his temperature hovered at a hundred and three. He was like an overworked engine with burnt-out gears and pistons. And for a moment, Schaefer wasn't sure he could bring him back. When Billy is able to speak again, he doesn't really know what happened. He just says, "I had this dream." It was like a story somebody was trying to tell me. Only it was like I was supposed to know it already. The story of this place. The god creature was here too. Schaefer looked down and, for the first time, saw the faint trace of a broken wall. Just a few stones mortared together amid the surrounding rubble. The side of one stone was incised with glyphs. Billy then says, "This, it's just the same. My people and these people, they both saw it." And they sing the same song too, that the god will return. Billy would feel okay after this, but his mind was still thinking about the images he saw. The group appears to move on and make their way to the pickup zone, which was only three or four miles away. Schaefer respected Billy's tracking abilities, but he didn't have any use for the metaphysical side of it. As Schaefer left the clearing, he looked back one last time and saw the Indian standing absolutely still. There was a blue macaw on Billy's shoulder as he stared, transfixed at the broken temple wall. The Sioux shook his head with a great sorrow. Throughout the novel, the predator we know is always referred to as the observer, and another display of its powers is when it's able to control the minds of animals. Then, with its sixth sense power of capture, it zeroed in on the hawk's essence. Its mind steering the bird toward it, like some remote controlled toy. The hawk's soul was lost to the alien, possessed like a zombie. This was effortless power the alien found it had over every creature it encountered on the host planet, everyone that is, but man. It could kill a man, but not take him over. Could dissect him down to the cell structure, but not inhabit him, body and soul. If this alien could not possess man, then it's a reason to utterly destroy the species. It later shows the ability in creating a copy or clone of the animal it touches, and after that, returning to its original form. Then the alien bent its head down, and almost seemed to nuzzle the bird, purring as if to calm it, till the stunning transformation occurred. First, the alien's skin swirled with all the mottled autumn shades, hues blending and churning like a kaleidoscope, till it settled on the exact slate gray of the bird's feathers. Then its lizard-like skin swirled down, and its form melted and compressed, and took the hawk's shape. When it was an exact clone of the animal, it dropped the limp hawk from its talons, letting it fall to be consumed by predators of its own. After Hawkins was attacked, the alien appeared to be content with a single trophy at a time, as if it needed to focus its whole mind on a microscopic examination of one pure specimen. One reason Billy was able to tune in so acutely to the intruder's thoughts was that the alien had begun to focus more individually on the men, as it systematically took and dissected them. In the novel, Schaefer ends up finding the body of Hawkins after they sweep the jungle. Then he saw it hanging so high it was nearly at the top of the tree, suspended from the ankles, much in the way Davis's crew had been. Hawkins' body swayed like a grisly pennant. Hideously displayed, his chest ripped open and emptied of its organs. Above the normal hum of the jungle, the only intruding sound was the screeching of a couple of vultures as they fought over rights to the flesh. Blaine gets taken out after Hawkins, but this time it's via the alien observer's throwable spear. The razor-sharp weapon entered Blaine's back at the base of the spine, ripping through the spinal column. With a force so awesome, it cut through bone and burst out through his chest. Grotesquely, the tip of the alien spearhead pierced Blaine's heart and rocketed it out of the body. The organ attached the tip like a macabre trophy. A hundred Mayan priests sighed in their temple graves. Then the deadly weapon slammed into the side of a bamboo tree, and the heart exploded in a bloody pulp that clung to the bark. The skull of Hawkins was placed within a trophy room in a ship. These two ideas were removed from the final version of the script. The alien reached out and placed it precisely on a glowing shelf along one side of the ship, caressing it gently, proudly, 
as one might a prized artifact from an ancient civilization, it felt the texture and stroked the hollows with a haunting detachment. As the green light glowed even more triumphant, it became evident that this was only one of many such trophies displayed around the room. Even its camouflage ability was different. Unlike the earlier incident of the cloning of the hawk, this time it didn't require a host animal to receive, it simply vanished, its whole substance, tissue, skin, organs, coasting on the jungle breezes, dispersed and invisible. The tracks in the soft dirt stopped a few yards from the ship at the edge of the clearing, so that a tracker like Billy might have supposed the creature had flown off into the sky. As for how the other soldiers perished in the story, Mac would get his throat slashed and he died instantly. Dylan got his arm cut off by the alien's throwable spear. He still remained alive for a few seconds, shooting the gun in his other hand, but then the same weapon gets thrown through his abdomen which bursts open and Dylan dies. Pancho Ramirez gets taken out by the alien throwing its spear once again, but it gets lodged into his neck and pins him to the ground. His legs and arms would twitch hideously in the seconds before death brought release. During the scene when Dutch would fight against the hunter around the fire, the alien would use voices of other people to lure Dutch somewhere. First, it used Anna's voice by saying, Look out behind you. And again, Look out major behind you. Then one more time by saying, Over here, I know the way out. Dutch was starting to believe Anna was nearby. But when the alien used Mac's voice by saying, Dylan, over here, that's when Dutch knew it was a trap, because Mac was already dead. After Dutch injured the creature, it escaped into the jungle. As Dutch chased after it, he would almost walk into a vast spider web that measured four feet across, blocking the path. After examining the web, it was not from an insect at all. It looked like hair fine wire. It was a trap. Dutch would hurl a branch into the center of the trap and watch the mechanism spring into action. There was a metallic snap, followed by a high-pitched whine, and the wood impacted on metal. The branch, five inches around, was violently torn apart, and pieces of wood flew into opposite directions, whipping into the jungle. It sounds like this was a stationary version of the net gun seen in Predator 2 and in the AVP movie. The creature did not have a self-destruct bomb. Instead, Dutch would find the alien's spear weapon after following it into its ship. He activated it, and the weapon shot off. It lodged in the back of the creature's neck, and its head exploded. The spearhead continued out through the alien's throat, burying itself into the side of the ship. This damage must have caused the ship to start a whirring sound, followed by vibrations of trembling, as if the ship was going to explode. Dutch runs out of the ship and avoids the explosion. And that's the end of the main points around the novel and how it differs from the movie. So let's go back to the topic of Billy's death scene. There was an interview with Sonny Landon posted on the website thearnoldfans.com and they asked him, was the death of your character ever shot on film or was it always an implied death? He makes a very long response to this question. It's mostly how his death was inspired from a story of Tim Rosevich. But the key points you can take from his response are this. When we shot it, I had no way to die in the film. With my death, you did hear me scream and then later you see my skull and backbone jerked out up in the tree. And that is all the information I can find about how Billy died in Predator. If I missed anything, you can put it down in the comments section. I'm also aware of many fan-made stories on the internet about different characters, including Billy. But I don't cover fan-made stuff because it's not part of the official lore. So if you want to see more lore videos like this one, all you have to do is subscribe to my channel and turn on the bell notification. Thank you so much for watching. This is Carlos or Acid Glow, and I'll see you on the next hunt.